having things like feeling nauseous or actually vomiting, experiencing diarrhea, constipation. Some girls get very, very tired and exhausted. Some might experience dizziness. Some might feel just quite irritable. Just, ugh. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> Are you wondering what to do if your young daughter is experiencing painful periods? What can you do at home? When should you go to the doctor? Well, in this video, I'm going to be talking all about this, so make sure you stay tuned to the very end. Now, dysmenorrhea is amazingly common, and I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn that it's the commonest reason for many, many young girls in their teens or adolescents to arrive at the doctor's surgery because they're having painful periods. So it's really important that we're clear about how to treat it, how to recognize it, and so on. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Responding with me, Dr. Sylvia. I'm a consultant in general practice and this is Ask Away Health. So today we're going to be looking at issues around painful periods. And this came through as a question from someone's mom with regards to painful periods. So let's start by looking at what painful periods are and what causes them. Now, the medical term for painful periods is dysmenorrhea. You might have come across that before or you haven't. If you come across that term, that's exactly what it means. There are two types of dysmenorrhea dysmenorrhea recognized in medicine. There is primary dysmenorrhea or there is secondary dysmenorrhea. So primary dysmenorrhea is when there is no abnormality in the body and a woman or a girl is experiencing painful periods. On the other hand, secondary dysmenorrhea is when the painful periods are related to an underlying problem and this could be a range of different things. For example, fibroids or endometriosis or pelvic inflammatory disease or PID. Um, or even having a coil, a coil device inserted for birth control. So these are examples of conditions where secondary dysmenorrhea can happen. So if you have a young girl or teen who we believe has primary dysmenorrhea, what can you do at home? What can she do at home to help? It's having uncomfortable, um, painful cramps. It's happening month after month after month. Everybody at home is feeling stressed by this, both mom, dad, siblings, and of course, the girl herself. So there are a few things you can do before you get to a doctor if you feel that it's not at the severity where a doctor needs to be involved. The very first thing, and I know you might think this is odd, but the very first thing I encourage everyone is to keep or track your menstrual cycle. Just track it. It can be as simple as a note on your phone. So on the day that the period, when you start bleeding and on the day you stop bleeding, it could be as simple as that. The menstrual cycle is usually calculated as the date of one menstrual period to the date of the next menstrual period, that's one cycle. So if you're making any record, all you have to put down really is the date of the first day which is when you started bleeding that's when the cycle begins so keeping track is the very first thing i think is essential for every woman and every girl this can help us to identify at which time of the month or the cycle when things are happening and if there's any pattern to them so the next thing is warm heat warm heat therapy to relieve pain this can be as simple as a water bottle. In fact, that's probably the simplest thing. A water bottle or many of us have heat packs or pads that we can either pop in the microwave um, for a period of time, a short period of time, and then bring it out and it's warmed up. Now, it's gentle heat. It's not hot because sometimes you get heat pockets and some areas are hotter than others. So I always say, please don't put it directly onto your skin. Allow it to cool a little bit and wrap something around it like a towel um, around it before applying it to your to the, your skin um, or on top of clothing so that it does not directly contact the skin and cause any burns and the same with water bottles which these days are usually they usually come inside their own little packs so that will help circulation that could help to relieve the pain so the next thing is position changing position so commonly many girls would just would curl up on their sides and holding onto the water bottles and I think that's just trying to find the most comfortable position, which is fine. And um, it's also a good idea to try and change positions. Um, it may be turning to the other side or lying on your back or lying on your tummy. We're all different. So for some girls, it may be lying on their tummy. The little pressure helps to relieve the pain. For some, it's actually lying on their backs. Um, so the thing is, change position, alter position um, to find the one that's most comfortable. And you may need to do that a few times so you're not staying on one side alone. 
muscle. The other thing is gentle exercise like stretching could help. And I will put a few poses on the screen that could be useful. Um, those who practice yoga might find that that's also quite useful. There's some positions that could help. Um, sometimes ladies with fibroids can have some relief from congestion around the pelvis. Um, so in the same way, there's some pose, there's some stretching exercises or movements that could help. Um, so we're not suggesting that you go running or you go, you know, any high impact cardio ex exercise or aerobics. No, no, no. Just stretching, gentle stretching exercise. Um, and of course, this might not be for everyone. There's some girls who might just be too drained or just exhausted. Fair enough. But if you're able, then I would encourage just a few stretching exercises, maybe a couple of times during the day or a couple of times every four or five hours just to move the body a bit and that might provide some relief. Next, some girls might find it useful to have a warm drink and nothing wrong with a cup of tea. Um, some people suggest that chocolate or warm chocolate might help. Um, <laughs> the science behind this is not very strong and some old people also suggest um, ginger tea or some herbal infusions like ginger drinks yeah the science behind that is not very strong but as um, if it's not going to do any harm and you have somebody who enjoys taking ginger tea then fair enough it's worth you know trying um, i'll just say go easy on the chocolate avoid excessive quantities so what about drugs well yes there are drugs um, that you can take to deal with the pain and these are common over the counter medicines the most effective that we know is drugs belonging to the group known as the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs examples are i Profen or naproxen. These are anti-inflammatory medicines and they're actually able to reduce the amount and effect of prostaglandins on the womb. So they can have a direct effect on reducing the cramps which is caused by the prostaglandin effect on the womb muscle and relieve the pain. So that is one um, drug that you can go for. You don't need a prescription for. What I'd recommend is um, to take it as soon as the first sign that the periods are starting if we know this is somebody who has been having painful periods for the last few months two or three months or so and thanks to our period tracking we know that she's about to start her periods then it's a good idea to either the day before or the night before when you think the periods are going to start or the first hint of pain to start taking ibuprofen on a regular basis now this has to be taken um, according to the individual's medical background if they are allergic to ibuprofen, please do not use it. It must be taken with food, not on an empty stomach. So please check with your doctor um, if you have any medical conditions and with the patient information leaflet. Um, there are people who can't have ibuprofen. For example, some people who have asthma cannot tolerate ibuprofen. So please be careful and it must never be taken on an empty stomach. So if it is good for you to use, then we recommend using it um, every six to eight hours on a regular basis. So instead of waiting for the pain to happen, you're trying to get ahead of the pain. And I think that could provide a lot of um, relief for the first two or three days because we know with primary dysmenorrhea we're dealing with this pain for the first two or three days so it's reasonable to, to, to sort of have your medication regularly for the first couple of days and by the third day it's probably going to be easy in a way so that's one way that you can take medication the other option of course is paracetamol and um, again very common over-the-counter medicine but it can be effective probably less than um, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs but you can use it as an alternative if you can't have um, ibuprofen or you can use it with ibuprofen so for example if the pain starts to come back but you're not due to have your next dose of ibuprofen then you can take some paracetamol again please make sure you're taking it as um, indicated on the information leaflet on the dosing leaflet and according to the age of the of the person and that they do not have any allergies or they are not you know they don't have any conditions where they shouldn't have these medicines for all the girls or ladies um there is the tens machine which is a device that is used to relieve pain that's something that might be useful um, if you have it um if you can get access to it so it is used for um, local pain relief uh, for many different conditions and it can also be used for people having painful periods so a TENS machine is something that you might want to consider if the other methods haven't worked and if we're still talking about sort of a moderate or mild 
um, experience of painful periods. So these are a few things that you can do at home to get going if you're dealing with painful periods and if you feel that the pain is quite considerable and is affecting your day-to-day -day activities then you should see your doctor so that you can have a discussion about what's actually going on and whether we should be treating it as something else. So in the majority of cases for girls who are experiencing painful periods, it's usually primary dysmenorrhea. It happens because the body is producing an excessive amount of a chemical known as prostaglandin and the effect of the prostaglandins is to make the wound contract a lot more than usual which leads to painful cramps. Most often when it's mild or moderate painful periods, we make the diagnosis clinically that is um, there usually isn't any examination or test. We usually go by the symptoms and say, oh, this is most likely to be primary dysmenorrhea. And if it does respond to some of the simple treatments or over-the-counter treatments, that's where things end. We don't usually go any further. And this is probably where you say, well, how do I know when it's severe? When can I bring my daughter to the doctor? I think it's a good place to actually talk about this because we've all got different pain thresholds. Um, and so what is particularly painful for one person may not be painful for somebody else. Um, so it's an individual thing. But I would say, and I'm sure my colleagues would agree, that if um, a person is experiencing pain to the extent that is preventing them from carrying out their usual activities, then that is a cause, that's a time to see a doctor. It may be being in so much pain you can't get off the bed and get ready for school or missing school as a result of painful periods or being unable to get to work and, you know, uh, because you're in so much pain, you can't leave the house. Um, so that degree of discomfort is actually interfering your ability to do what you would normally do without really thinking about it. Let's look at who is more likely to get primary dysmenorrhea. I've heard people who, for some reason or the other, could be more um, at risk of developing primary dysmenorrhea. Well, we have observed that it seems to happen more frequently in girls who start their periods earlier than usual. So there is an, a range of ages at which girls start to have their periods. That's also known as menarche. And this range sort of travels from between 10 to 11 or 12 years old to 13, 14 or 15 years on average. If a girl is starting her period sort of around the age of 10, there is some thought that perhaps this girl may be more at risk of having painful periods. Now, this is just a range. Some girls could start um, around 10 and have perfectly normal periods. Um, and some girls may start um, earlier and still have perfectly normal periods. But if there's an observation that it seems to be more um, painful periods seem to be more of an issue in girls who have their periods at an earlier age. The other thing is that girls or women who have heavy menstrual bleeding tend to suffer more with period pain. Something else is the possible family connection. So if your mom, sisters or cousin had painful periods, then there's a chance that you will also experience painful periods. So, so there's something about it running in the family. And I hear this commonly from patients who um, when you talk to them about their background and their family background you see that there's a bit of a thread or a bit of a link from fam one family member to another. For older ladies never having been pregnant may also be related to experiencing painful periods so that's something to think about. So if I see a young girl or teenager who's complaining of painful periods, I'm more likely to consider that it's primary dysmenorrhea. If the pain starts a little bit before the period or as the period starts and happens to be most severe in the first couple of days or the first two to three days of that period before it starts to get better as the period progresses. Now, this is different from experiencing pelvic pain um, at other times of the cycle or experiencing pelvic pain as the period is about ending. Now, another clue that it might be primary dysmenorrhea is if this girl started her periods and had no problems for the first a few months, maybe the first six to 12 months had periods, no pain, and then starts to have painful periods. So what I'm saying is that it's within the first six to 12 months, usually of 
actually starting her period journey, her menarche. Um, so this could suggest that this is primary dysmenorrhea. Now, it's quite different from girls or women with secondary dysmenorrhea whose experience may be that they had not experienced painful periods or anything like that until several years after. So maybe they started their periods age 12 and you know, no problems until maybe their early 20s and then suddenly started to have painful periods. This is more likely to be something to do with secondary dysmenorrhea than with primary dysmenorrhea. Another clue would be if there are no symptoms outside of those days during the period. So by this I mean from the day of the period until after the period ends is when this, the, the pain with the period starts and ends. Afterwards, she bounces back to normal unless she's got very heavy bleeding and she's experiencing anemia but i don't want to digress into that but if if the problem is mainly painful periods from primary dysmenorrhea then from the day the period starts till the day ends generally that holds the painful periods she's fine during the rest of the month now that's different from secondary dysmenorrhea where um, if somebody has fibroids, for example, or it's endometriosis, then they would have other symptoms related to these conditions. This might be feeling bloated, problems passing urine, pain at other times, experiencing painful sex for those who are sexually active and so on. So that might be another clue that we're dealing with primary dysmenorrhea when the symptoms start and end with the uh, menstrual bleeding. Right, so what's the pain like? Okay, so the pain is usually located in the lower abdomen and pelvis. That's where you generally get the complaints from. And it's usually a pain that is sharp, but it can be dull, like a dull ache or cramp is how girls will describe it. It might just stay in the lower abdomen, but for some, it might go around to the back, middle of the back or the right or the left side of the, um, the back. Some girls, it travels into the thighs or the legs. So that's the nature of the pain, it's sort of located within that area. I think it's also good to to note that I was just saying about with secondary dysmenorrhea having symptoms outside of the menstrual flow. Now with primary dysmenorrhea during the time of the blood flow of the menses it's also not unusual to get other non-gynecological symptoms if I can put it that way. So I mean having things like feeling nauseous or actually vomiting, experiencing diarrhea, constipation. Some girls get very very tired and exhausted. Some might experience dizziness. Some might feel just quite irritable just ugh. yeah ugh. <laughs> so with that said even though there's some clues that indicate something is primary dysmenorrhea sometimes we can mistake it for secondary dysmenorrhea so it's a very good idea if somebody's having really bad frequent it's happening month after month after month interrupting school and so on it's a good idea to go to see the doctor so that they can have a look and we can establish whether we're dealing with primary or secondary dysmenorrhea. So the doctor will try to get extra details of the menstrual cycle, um, try and find out about what the symptoms are like, find out about family history and so on. Then they might want to do um, some tests. Uh, well, before that, they might want to do an examination. Now, examination might be things like vital signs, blood pressures, especially if someone is feeling dizzy, um, having trouble passing urine, they might take urine sample, check the blood sugar and so on. On, and they might just examine the tummy as well so the abdomen now for young girls adolescents and teens we gps wouldn't necessarily start to do pelvic examinations that is vaginal examinations or using a speculum for girls of that age and if we thought that the symptoms were of such a nature where it's important to find out what's going on within the pelvis with that kind of examination then we would um, get our specialist colleague uh, routinely we would probably stop at, at the abdominal examination uh, we could also arrange for blood tests and again, this all depends on the type of symptoms that an individual presents with. But it is good practice to make sure that we're not dealing with secondary dysmenorrhea. And so your doctor will need to ask these questions and might need to do some tests and some examination to be able to work this out. Usually with primary dysmenorrhea, the test results will all come back normal. We will not find anything on examination. And this is different to, for example, somebody who has fibroids. When you could do an abdominal examination and feel that the um, abdomen is a little bit bulky and that 
might suggest the presence of fibroids and then the doctor would need to do a range a scan. So if you have a young girl or teen who we believe has primary dysmenorrhea, what can you do at home? What can she do at home to help? At this point, I do talk about a lot of other menstrual related issues and if you want to watch, I've got a playlist here. Please go and check it out. I'll leave the link in the description box as well. And if you need to ask any questions, use our email health information service. That link is also in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the very next video. Bye.